We're here with Ian Anderson on Visual Radio. Hello, Ian. Hello there. Hey, it's great to speak with you. You know, back in the 70s when British bands were breaking into America, there were a lot of parallel imports coming in. And the Tull albums, Aqualung, Thick as a Brick, they were piled up in the Harvard Square and Central Square Cambridge and Discount Records and New England Music City, and they would fly out of the stores. People would be the first in America to have them. It was, it was quite a buzz. And, and Tull had the buzz in my high school. It was very hip to have gone and seen Jethro Tull. I just wanted to share that with you. Well, that's very nice of you to share that with me. And um, what was hit back when you were in high school is probably, um, I don't know, a curse from the past today. If you're a young man or lady growing up in uh, in North America and you're having to suffer the endless blue comfort blanket of classic rock that makes your parents happy and sleep well at night, then <laughs> it could be a curse today, couldn't it? Who knows? Well, my concern is that today the kids don't understand that that thrill of going and finding uh, a record before it comes out in America the week before, you know, and and being able to play it. And, you know, when you have a great new record today, it's a lot different from those days. I feel. Yes, yes, it is. And, and I think there's um, a, different, uh, a different way of reaching out these days, and I, I certainly take advantage of it, which is that when I find uh, an interest in a particular artist or a particular piece of record product or a new song that i i go along and buy it on itunes or whatever and it's um it's it is an an enormously accessible world of music these days of all kinds of music from classical music to jazz and pop and rock and world music it's all out there and it's relatively easy to to, to find and i think um, perhaps the fact that it is so easy makes it less of a challenge and maybe ultimately perhaps less rewarding, but uh, nonetheless, I think I would trade off that sense of achievement that I might have had finding a particular record in some hard-to-reach record store in some suburb of a big town somewhere. I would trade that off any time for being able to sit in my own home and uh, access the world of music and and buy what I choose to buy without uh, having to get in a, a motor car and burn up a lot of gasoline to to get to a, 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 a record store. So, yeah, I think I think on balance I prefer things the way they are now, really. Oh, that's amazing, because I walked into a, a wholesale club uh, here in Boston, and mm-hmm. they had DVDs so you can get, you know, Living with the Past by Jethro Tull, but they don't have CDs anymore, and it stunned yeah. me. It's stunning. Well, it's, it, it is indeed, and, of course, there are very few um, these days, very few... Uh, uh, record stores as we know them that are still around and in a lot of cases if you want to buy a physical product you've got to buy it from a, a mail order source you know like a, an Amazon or whatever it is and and, um, and wait for a, two or three days for it to arrive through your letterbox but that's the changing world we live in and I, I personally you know I, I, I prefer the convenience of having music audio files um, which I can access any time, including the whole vast Jethro Tull and Ian Anderson repertoire, because when I have to learn a song, as I shall be doing in an hour or two from now, then it's all it's all in one convenient MP3 player, um, which I'm carrying with me, and and it's all it's always there. Everything I everything I need, everything I I have, it's there. And CDs, while some people rather like to have them um, on their living room shelves. To me, they're a bit of a clutter, and I can't really profess a lot of warmth and attraction to the idea of a, a CD with its rather minuscule little artwork you can hardly read. And and um, but nor nor would I want to have to own vinyl albums and um, and endure the horrible scratchy reality of of uh, nastily compressed and limited audio with inner groove distortion and uh, all the problems associated with cutting a vinyl master, which uh, I remember so well from years gone by, was always a really quite a, you know, quite a, an upsetting and disappointing experience. So, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm your MP3 guy. I, I'm a, an old man, but I live in the modern age, and I, I utilize all the convenience of digital technology whenever it suits me. I'd and, like then my, I'm, uh... and then I'm foul-mouthed about it when it doesn't work, <laughs> but there you go. I like my special collector's edition of Aqualung Live on Fuel. Fuel to All Fuel. right, yeah. Uh, is that available on download? Um, well, I'm not sure about a collector's v- version of it, but you can probably find um, you can probably find most uh, most versions of, uh, of Aqualung that have been recorded. I would have thought, um, unless they've been some of those curious little specialist companies who used to uh, do uh, remasters 
usually with uh, vinyl remasters, which were um, uh, somewhat questionable in, in regard to whether they're any better than the originals, but we, there were a few of those out in years gone by, and maybe some of those have made it into the digital world. I, I don't know. I'm not a collector. I'm a pragmatic music person. I only, I, I only have music that um, I actually really need for a reason, you know, for reference or or something I really want to listen to, but I don't really collect things for the sake of collecting them, whether it's music or musical instruments or guns or cameras or watches or anything that I happen to have a few of. I don't actually think of it as collecting. I always think collecting is a bit of a bit of an obsession, sort of amassing stuff. And I'm I'm not that keen on stuff. I've got I've got plenty of stuff. I've got all the stuff I need really and uh, I think I actually probably do with a bit less stuff. Maybe I should give it to, to Elton John, and he can have another auction. <laughs> there you go. Hmm. Uh, Lou Reed is one of my favorite artists, and one thing about Lou is he's a great essayist, and he doesn't do enough of it for me. Uh, when you read an essay from Lou Reed, he really drives the point home. Uh, Ian Anderson is a great speaker, and I would love to hear you on a speaker's tour. Do you have any lecture circuit uh, ideas for the future? Not really. It's something that sort of come up, I guess. It had been, you know, mentioned as a, a thing to do. But I, I think my my interests are probably, probably more in combining elements of music with something else. And I, I indeed did that some years ago with the Rubbing Elbows tours that I did in in the USA, where we, you know, it was part talk show, part uh, special guest, part uh, part regular performance, and and that was kind of mixing it up, but. As a nightly performance, it was very grueling because of the special guests and the fact we worked with uh, people from local radio and uh, who needed their hands holding sometimes in front of a live audience. So it was actually quite daunting. It was a very demanding, um, you know, afternoon sound check and rehearsal with guests, and and then a you know a more than two hour show. So it was um, at the end of two two of those tours. I, I think I was um, probably more exhausted than I have been, you know, doing. Uh, doing outdoor Jethro Tull shows in the middle of summer in Greece or somewhere, which are exhausting for different reasons. You brought up uh, collecting. With YouTube now, people uh, can find almost anything just up on YouTube. What do you think of Jethro Tull and Ian Anderson music that's up on the YouTube? Well, I can't really comment on that because I don't really have a particular reason to go and look at it or listen to it. But what I do find is that... um, what is very useful to me is um, is the fact that if I'm, you know, particularly with other artists, or if I'm looking at someone, you know, perhaps with a view to a, a guest or a guest artist or a band or whatever it might be, then it is useful to get an idea of how they play live and how they they work live. And and so, I mean, when we had a special guest a year or so ago, Anushka Shankar, the daughter of Ravi Shankar, played on a tour in India with us as our guest and. It was a way of getting a little bit to know her playing and the way just her body language on stage and get a feel for how she performed. And and so it was very useful to be able to find some even pretty grisly quality um, examples of her performing on YouTube. So I I found it quite useful to do. Ian, who came up with the concept for the uh, 2002, was it, Living with the Past DVD? Well, it wasn't so much a concept. It was just really the beginning of a period of time, I suppose, when DVDs were beginning to become a meaningful part of uh, of entertainment. I mean, it, it wasn't uh, quite at the beginning of the DVD revolution, but to begin with, there were players and not very much to play on them. And so people were clamoring for, uh, for um, music DVDs and, uh, I guess, movies were not apart from old movies, were not being released on DVD in, until you know, until years rather than months had gone by, or weeks as it is now. So uh, music DVDs had a run, uh, albeit quite a short one, of a couple of years of, of doing rather well, and, um, and so we released a music DVD of, uh, of a live concert, which was kind of revisiting some of that, 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 that older repertoire in a live concert we recorded. I can't remember where... We actually recorded. It might have been in London, and then, um, and then, of course, music DVDs started to tail off in uh, in music in, in actual sales figures because of uh, the um, 
the plethora of, of available material on DVD and, and recordable DVDs where you could hook it up to your TV and record everything that um, you wanted. So these days, music DVDs, are they, if, you, if you say perhaps if a music DVD sold you know, 100,000 copies, which is a pretty respectable figure in the USA, back in uh, 2002 or 2000, by um, buying it you know, 10 years down the line, uh, that same music DVD will probably sell 10,000 copies. It's simply not a very popular medium anymore, so I'm glad that we, we did actually manage to get in there and do it at that particular time. And A recent music DVD of ours, which uh, came out at the end of last year, which was the live at Madison Square Gardens, um, 1978 satellite broadcast uh, performance, um, I actually thought it was only going to sell maybe 10,000 copies, but, but in fact it sold about 30,000 copies, which is a lot better than I thought it would do. And, um, uh, you know, that, that's a pretty respectable figure for these days. That's impressive in this market, in this climate. Mm. Uh, I, I like the interviews in between the songs. People don't do that enough. So you get to talk. Well, but yeah, people, people who do interviews um, uh, and, and try and broaden the, the basis. Just like, I suppose when you, if you get, a, mu if you get a, uh, a movie on DVD, then you'll find all the outtakes and the interviews with the stars and all the other things that are the, the added value aspect of, of, of trying to be competitive. And when we did the Living, and Living With the Past DVD, which, um, you know, which sold about 100,000 copies, it was... Um, it was um, kind of early days, and, and you know, I, I, I paid for it and produced it, and uh, I wouldn't do that today because, you know, to try and do... So it is arguably cheaper to produce a DVD today. I mean, the, the cost of uh, cameras and crews and things has actually come down because it is such a, such a competitive environment, which has driven the, the, the actual production cost down a bit. But um, the, the sales, on the other hand... Uh, you know, you'd be lucky if you break even doing a DVD these days. And um, those that we have tend to be things that are in the can. Either it's a live performance that perhaps has been uh, for television, or and, and so it's kind of ready-made. The DVD comes with the with the package, so to speak. <laughs> it's just someone someone hits record in a back room as it's being broadcast, basically. So that way, it's uh, it's kind of easy. But uh, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't uh, produce pay for and uh, initiate a, uh, a DVD, I don't think, in this day and age. It I, I, I would be a lot of work for, um, for very precious little in the way of, of income. I'd be lucky to break even, I think. I'm looking at Polestar right now in the, in the upcoming tour, and it's got you um, in Greece, Israel, Ontario, Norway, and America. It's quite a uh, spread. Yeah, well, it it is, and and we head off. Um, and we just come back from uh, touring in uh, Scandinavia and Germany and Italy, and we're we're um, uh, USA next for the month of June, and then July we're back in Europe playing a whole bunch of places from from uh, again up to Norway and uh, and down as, as as you rightly point out, as far as uh, as far as Greece and uh, various points in between, and um, later on, of course, we go and. Yet again to uh, Israel, where I, I, I am strangely drawn to Israel with all of its complexities and difficult issues and, and, f and the feelings I think that you have when you visit there and perform in concert. There's an awful lot of uh, soul-searching and uh, scratching of, uh, of heads that goes on as to whether or not we really should be there doing what we do. But... Um, I've always tried to keep politics and personal beliefs away from uh, away from the the idea of performing music to people because that is the one thing I can always feel reassured about is that you get people together in a in a room or in a space and in this case it's an ancient amphitheater on the shore of the Mediterranean and it it, it is you know you you suspend for a while all of those issues and you bring people together in a way which is um is uniting um, on on a, on a on a nicer and higher plane, I think, than uh, than some of the um, some of the levels in which you can find yourself um, getting quite uh, upset in certain parts of the country or certain parts of the world that that I visit. Um, you know, there are lots of times you just have to try and blank it out and get on with uh, the job of um, 
of that mutual exchange, which performance is, and um, try and keep your minds off the politics, of the geopolitics, and the uh, and all the things that go with it. And two questions on that: uh, Are the audiences, say, in Israel, Germany, Greece, do they pick up on different albums than, say, we in America? Do you feel them? Mm, well, they... the, 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 there is a certain shift of influence. I think with certain records that have had more impact. Uh, I mean, the the album Broadsword was a, a very successful one in in Germany, for example, but not so in the USA. Um, but there are albums that are pretty universal, like Aqualung and. Uh, I guess Stand Up is pretty well known, uh, although in retrospect, people probably bought that after they bought Aqualung and Thick as a Brick and others. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, um, there's a certain there's a certain common ground where you can feel reasonably assured that uh, certain repertoire works in all places. But um, um, perhaps the biggest reassurance comes from playing new music, which is not on record anywhere, and playing that to an audience is a is always a real test of the music and a test of perception um, from different people in different places. And so if you, if you introduce some new material that, that people can't have heard before, and it meets with approval right across a, a broad swathe of countries and and um, languages and, and cultural differences, then you can feel pretty good about that as a performer because you think, right, I've come up with a piece of music here which is 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 passing the ultimate test of, of um, making a fairly instant impression on people on first listening, and that, that's always quite gratifying to do. So I would imagine you have the newer material that hasn't been recorded yet um, in all the concerts. Do you shift the concerts from one country to another? Do you shift the set list? We uh, certainly do uh, move things around a little bit uh, as we go along, and it, it will also depend on perhaps where, where we last played uh, um, or when we last played in a, in a particular city, um, you know, we go back and look at the set list, and we find there are too many things that are, um, you know, the same from a previous occasion. Then we, we would we would try to change that so that we, you know, we try to make, you know, successive shows between 50 and 80 percent different to the last time we played there. But sooner or later you get caught out because, of course, we don't just play the same things in the same the same places in the same rotation right. every two or three or four years or whatever it might be. So you, you know you do have to be a little bit um, uh, you know taking that little bit of care to make sure that you're not repeating yourself. But um, luckily, of course, these days with laptop computers and so on, we can carry all that information, all that data travels with us, so we can always look up look up set list to see what we played. You know, ten years ago in your town, and uh, try and make sure that we do something different. I would love to see selections from different concerts all around the world. Do you have enough footage that, say, the cameras running every night are just different nights? No, we 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 don't we don't do uh, video recording of our concerts at all. Um, we leave that up to half the audience with their horrible little <laughs> cell phones. Um, I notice with with some relief a theatre that I'm playing in the in the fall of this year in the USA on a solo tour that the, the theatre posted on its website a whole list of uh, advisories to audiences which were um, zero tolerance about underage consumption of alcohol, um, uh, forbidden use of cell phones, forbidden use of cameras, forbidden use to to sit and talk to your neighbour in the theatre during the performance, all sorts of things which sounded quite draconian, but, I mean, to me, are just perfectly common sense and courtesy. You know, if you're going to watch a, a music concert, then... Um, if you know, if you're at some head banging heavy metal kind of concert, well, I can understand there's a different kind of behaviour. But if you're watching music which is, should we say, more thinking man's pop or rock music, then it's nice not to irritate your neighbours by using cell phones and flashing cameras or, you know, or talking loudly to you know people around you. And they say, seem to me very common sense things that, that most people would would understand intuitively and and, and not not have to be warned off doing by a, by a theater's website. But, um, you know, th those are the kind of issues I guess we face these days that sometimes the culture is so different in different different cities, even within the same country. And we notice that in the UK. You know, if you're playing in uh, Newcastle on a Saturday night, it's going to be a little different to be, you know, playing in some suburb of London on a, on a Monday night. And um, people just do behave differently in different places. And you have to accept that up to a point. And then you start cursing, but and even hopefully, the, ho hopefully not with the microphone on. <laughs> mm. 
even the fans uh, seem to have a debate over their right to be able to tape the music because they paid for a ticket and they want to post it on YouTube, and they don't seem to have any regard for copyright. No, well, uh, they, they don't, and a lot of people think that's quite harmless just to you know, hold up their new super-duper cell phone or some little digital camera and, and you know, record three or four minutes of... Uh, of audio and video and put it on YouTube. There are people who get a lot of, you know, get a big kick out of doing that, and um, it may seem harmless enough. But you know, I'm, I'm instinctively, I'm afraid, I don't approve of of taping in that environment. Apart from anything else, it, I think it's right. It can be very intrusive to the people around you to know that someone is, uh, you know, holding up their their phone and uh, you know, to over the heads of the audience to. Um, to record something, or, or quite often, what people do is they make they make a call on their cell phone, and, and then hold the hold the hold the, hold the phone up to the uh, you know towards the stage in order that the person on the other end can hear where they are. It's, it's rather it's rather like that excruciatingly loud voice you hear if you're travelling on a public train service here from somebody saying, "Hello, it's me. I'm on the train." <laughs> I find all that really quite annoying. Yes, I'm I'm a, I'm a sensitive. And um, sometimes um, uh, unhappy cell phone user myself because I, I do feel quite, you know, conspicuous if I'm using a phone in a public place. I, I hate to annoy people, um, and, and I hope that they will also try to avoid annoying me by using their cell phones and talking very loudly or waving them around in my face. So yeah, I'm 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 not really one for. Uh, I don't. I certainly don't approve of people uh, doing that. I, I think if you can't actually remember a concert, if you if you're if you're so busy recording it or taking photographs with your new camera and you haven't even figured out how to turn the flash off, then you know you're probably going to be not exactly paying attention to what's going on from the stage. And I I, I rather think that you know you're there to enjoy an experience, and if you're paying attention, you should remember it. You don't have to record it. Goodness me. Well, I know you're a busy man. I'd talk to you for three or four hours if I could. But uh, my final question, Bank of America Pavilion, June 15th. You're playing with Procol Harum, which I think is a marvelous pairing. Um, any surprises for us? Well, the surprises are, there are, I think, fundamentally, in order of importance, that Gary Brooker is still alive. <laughs> Secondly, second most important thing, I'm still alive because we are old men. Gary's actually slightly older than me, and... Um, and uh, he, he's in very good. Um, he's in very good shape as a performer. Surprisingly, he's for, for a, a, a certain amount of self abuse over the years. He's he's actually you know still really a great singer. And um, I've worked with Gary a couple of times in recent years, and um, uh, even accompanied him on the flute um, on a TV show in Germany where we did Whiter Shade of Pale, which is always one of my. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not really a big fan of other people's music most of the time because I just just find I, I do so much music myself is about all I can uh, I can cope with. But uh, there are certain classic songs that I, I do think are really quite wonderful, and I've always had the ambition to play flute on a whiter shade of pale. And if um, if um, if I should be asked, then um, um, Nights in White Satin by the Moody Blues. So um, you know, there's some really good tunes out there that just feel you know kind of right for a little uh, a little flute. Um, addition or intrusion <laughs> depending on your point of view but yes i'm i'm looking forward to seeing procol harum again i haven't played with well they, they've done tours with us in the past but not uh, not for about 15 years or so so be interesting to see same pretty much the same band as last time strangely enough but um gary's the only man from the original band but then he's the singer and the the main the main the main man anyway so we should be grateful he's still alive and kicking and up there to do it again and uh, I for one shall be listening to their set most nights and hopefully enjoying it Ian your music means a lot to me it's been an honor to speak with you and I hope you go on the lecture circuit well that that would be um uh, that, that would be an interesting option if I could find any any availabilities but I guess Tony Blair has probably taken up all the theaters <laughs> and all the all the, um, the the schedules for some time to come. He, he's he's apparently told his friends he needs to make at least five million pounds, you know, about seven and a half million U.S. dollars each year to to pay for his staff and his houses and all the rest of it. And so he's uh, he's busy he's busy out there trading on being um, being an ex prime minister, albeit a very unpopular one, and um, and I suppose in the USA being George Bush's uh, faithful buddy. Um, 
but um, yeah, T- Tony Blair is one of those characters. He's not a uh, he's not a bad man, you know, any more than George Bush was a bad man. In fact, I always rather liked George Bush in a funny kind of way. I think he always thought he had a good sense of humour. And um, but Tony Blair is an odd guy. So yeah, the lecture circuit it just conjures up so someone cashing in, doing something by uh, trying to sound rather grand and important. So I'm I'm afraid. It's unlikely I would do it. I think I'd probably stick to playing music and talking only when when asked on interviews such as this. But very nice to talk to you. Looking forward to being in Boston again. And uh, keep my keep my clam chowder warm for me. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ian Anderson. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye now.